Welcome to Through the Bible, a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Our teacher, of course, is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and I'm your host, Steve Schwetz. And if you're like me, you're interested in studying the Bible because you want to know what God says about a lot of different topics. But at the end of the day, the most important topic of the Bible is how to know God for yourself. John 17, 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You know, many deceivers would have us think differently. And that's why Dr. McGee's study today in 1 Timothy 3 is so critical. But praise God, when his word is taught faithfully, people's hearts are stirred to believe and their desires are changed for eternity. I'm excited to share with you two testimonies from listeners who heard God's word and they've never been the same. A listener in Somerset, Pennsylvania writes this, Many questions about the Bible are answered just by listening to your programs. I have struggled in my walk with God. However, it is 100% better because I'm understanding His Word better, and I am even more in love with Him. I have overcome a lot of things, all because God set me down and put Pastor McGee's teaching in my life. Thank you very much for your obedience to God, because it has produced obedience in me. Well, thanks for writing. And then here's another one from someone in Memphis, Tennessee. I wrote you guys this letter in May. I never sent it because I wanted to put money with it. I didn't think I had enough to spare. I have now realized my salary is not mine to begin with. I was putting more faith in money than God. With great joy, I have enclosed money for fuel for the Bible bus. I also wanted to let you know how much your ministry means to me. Drugs have controlled most of my life, but I was led to Christ by Billy Graham. I started attending church and tried reading the Bible, but I couldn't make heads or tails of it or the many sermons I sat through. A good friend kept telling me about Through the Bible and mentioned that you were starting the ride through Genesis again. In these past two years, I've only missed the bus a couple of times. Today, I'm not half the man I hope to be, but I'm twice the man I used to be. I owe a lot of that growth to all of you. What a great letter. You know, as we study God's Word together, let's pray that we too can say we aren't who we hope to be, but so much different than who we once were. And let's pray many more hop aboard the Bible bus and join us. If you can, please bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us new hearts and lives by the power of your Spirit and the truth of your Word. We love you and worship you with our obedience today. Help us understand your Word now, and please draw many more into a relationship with your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. We're off to 1 Timothy chapter 3 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, if you have your Bible... I want you to turn with us today to the fourth chapter of the first epistle of Paul to Timothy. And before we get into that, I should call attention to the fact that the word that opens up the fourth chapter, verse 1, is now. That is, that's the way it is in our translation. But I think the better translation should be, but the Spirit speaketh expressly. That is, it puts it in contrast to what he has said back in that primitive creed of the church in verse 16, where he said, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the nations, believed on in the world, received up in the glory, and then but the Spirit expressly, and that's over in contrast to it. Now, this verse 16 is the great creed of the church, which actually we had to go over so speedily last time that I want to come back to that great statement that is made here. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. And this, I think, is certainly Paul teaching the virgin birth of Christ. And it speaks also of Christ's existence before his incarnation, and that it was spiritual, of course. He was in the form of God, Paul says in Philippians 2, 6. He was the effulgence of God's glory, and the express image of his substance, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 1, 3, and that God is a spirit. And the Lord Jesus himself said that in John 4, 24. Now, from this condition, 
as God, not seen with human eyes. He came into manifestation, into sight, if you please, in the flesh. He became a man, and he entered into human conditions. And under these human conditions, the attributes of his essential spiritual personality were veiled. In fact, that's the thought that John gives in his gospel. The word became flesh, that is, was born flesh. Or we're told he pitched his tent here among us. He was born flesh. He was made flesh and took his place here among us. And the thought there, he was veiled in human flesh, just as God was not visible in the tabernacle, then he tabernacled here among us in human flesh. But now since he's a human being, then he's like we are, we can know something about God. But under these human conditions, the attributes of his essential being was veiled. He did not appear to man what he really was. He was not recognized by them as who he was, the one who in the beginning was God and was with God and was God. And all things were made by him. Why came a little helpless baby and he was the image of the invisible God as one with God. And he had all power in heaven and in earth But down here, he took upon himself human flesh. And as a result, why he was treated down here as an imposter, a usurper, a blasphemer. He was hated. He was persecuted. He was murdered. He was poor. He was tempted. He was tried. He could shed tears. He was a man of sorrows. Now, in all of that, he was not justified in the flesh, you see. He came out of the sphere of his spiritual being and came down to this earth. And down here, why, he took a lowly place. But now, you see, as it says here, he was manifest in the flesh. This is the way the world saw him, but justified in the spirit. And there were times when his glory broke out down here. There were revelations and expressions and witnesses of who he really was when he was down here. That was seen in his virgin birth and the presence of angels there. It was seen at his baptism, at his transfiguration, and at the time they came out to arrest him and the things that even happened at his crucifixion that caused the centurion there to say truly, this is the Son of God. But it was when he came back from the dead. We see him now justified, and he now has gone back to the right hand of God. No enemy can touch him from now on. He'll never be dishonored again. No one in his presence will ever be able to do that again because he came down here, and the fact that he's gone back there, now it means our justification Because down here, he was delivered for our offenses. He was taking our place as a sinner. Now he gives us his place up yonder, and we're justified. And today, he's justified in the spirit up yonder and of who he really was. How wonderful this is. Now, in contrast to that, in the world, but the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, I have said in my notes that the latter times here refers to the last days of the church on earth. I want to say to you now that I want to change that because I believe here that The expression in the latter times and the last days that are mentioned over in 2 Timothy 3.1, I think that the last days here had to do with that actually that was immediately following the life of Paul. Because you see, when he was in Ephesus, 
he had warned them that there would come in wolves in sheep's clothing that would deceive believers. And actually, the apostasy began at that time. John could say already there are many antichrists, and already error had entered in to the church, and we find that many churches of the early churches had gone off into a heresy. Actually, the first great church was the Coptic church in Africa. It was way ahead of the others. North Africa produced some of the greatest saints in the early church. Augustine came from there. Tertullian came from there. Athanasius came from there. And many of the great saints of the church But they went off into a heresy, you see. They departed from the faith so that what we have here in the latter times has to do with that which was coming. It did not have the coming of Christ in view at all. But when you come over to 2 Timothy 3.1, in the last days, there will be perilous times. Then you're dealing there with a technical expression that speaks of the last days of the church here on earth before the Lord Jesus takes it out. Now, I do not think that here that is the thought that we have in mind. The latter times refer to our times today. And we do not know whether Christ is coming before this century ends. There's some saying that, but they don't know. And it's dangerous to teach that sort of thing, I believe, today. But the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, There would come in the last times, the latter times, not the last, but the latter times, it means that which was ahead of the church, and we've had just about 1,900 years of it now, some, that is, there would be heretical teachers, and they would mislead a great company of people, and they shall depart from the faith. Now, You have this word here for depart from the faith. It actually means departure. And as we saw in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, that there would be an apostasy actually means that there would be a departure. And that departure was the rapture, that this matter of apostasy had been in the church a long time. That would not be new at the end of the age by any means. I think it will grow, and it has grown down through the years. And when the church is raptured, you will have on the earth an organization, as we saw in 2 Thessalonians. But that organization is totally apostate because the true church has been raptured and taken out of the world. And this has been almost literally translated here apostasy, that some shall apostatize from the faith, and that this is the apostasy. Well, that means to depart. It means a departure. And a departure means you've got to have a point, not only of where you're going, but where you've come from. And the place they've come from means they have professed at one time to hold to the faith, but now they have departed from it. And the word literally means, it's apohistomy. Histomy means to stand, and apo means away from. You see, you go away from a place. That's departure from a place. Now, the place that they were was the faith. They held it. Now they've departed from the faith. There cannot be an apostasy in paganism because they've never professed the faith. They've never professed to trust Christ as Savior. They've never heard about him, and there can be no apostasy there. It has to come in the organized church, and that is exactly what Paul is talking about here, that the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now, when they depart from the faith, what's responsible for it? What is it that's caused them to depart from the faith? Is it because they become highly intellectual? 
Is it because of scientific developments and the increase of knowledge is revealed that the faith cannot be helped? Oh, no, no. They'll depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits. Now, actually, seducing spirits, and that word seducing is a very interesting word. It means wandering and roving, and it comes from the word vagabond or a deceiver or a seducer. In fact, Satan is called that, so that they shall give heed to seducing spirits. That is, this is satanic spirits and doctrines of demons. That's the correct translation. They'll give attention to that sort of thing. Now, there is a grave departure today. And the thing that has alarmed a great many people is this, that in this very materialistic age, There is a return today to the spirit world, and a great emphasis is placed on it. Now, we are told today to try the spirits, to see whether they be of God or not, because there's gone out into the world. There's gone out these seducing spirits. Now, the real test is this creed up here, that God was manifest in the flesh, and justified in the Spirit, that the only way of salvation is through the death of Christ. And this is the way that you can test these doctrines of demons today. Now, there has gone over a very small segment of folk today. They are believers, at least they claim to be believers. And I can't understand why they've gone over into this great emphasis on demonism today. So many people right now are interested in that subject, and they read everything on it. Well, I think that we're seeing a real manifestation of it, but a lady called me all the way from El Paso, Texas, the other day, because believers there were getting involved in this, spending a great deal of time talking about it. Well, I want to say to you, I think that the best thing that you and I can do for the devil is to show him a clean pair of heels, That's the best thing that we can do and not be a bunch of heels and stick around and get ourselves involved and engaged in all of this. And some folk are going around today casting out demons. Let's stay clear of this because we are warned against this, this doctrines of demons. Stay away from it today and test everyone by its acknowledgement of the fact of the deity of Christ, that God was manifest in the flesh, and that we're justified through the redemption that he wrought for us on the cross. Now, the thing they do, speaking lies and hypocrisy. They pretend to be very pious and very religious. I've been in the church just long enough to always be suspicious of this very pious position that a great many people take, being super-duper saints, that they've got something special. My friend, if you do have the truth, it'll have to make you humble because the first thing you're going to find out is really how little you know. I thought one time I knew a little about the Bible, but I've come to a place today how ignorant I am. I've really got a whole lot of nerve to teach the Bible today, as ignorant of it as I am. But my friend, I look about me today, and I see those that are old, they know practically nothing about the Word of God. And today, they are becoming authorities in this field. May I say to you, speaking lies in hypocrisy, pretending to be something that they are not, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, you remember the thing that should characterize the visible church was faith and love and a good conscience, tender-hearted people. I want to tell you, there are a lot of these folk that have gone over. They're talking too much today about sex in the church. And I want to tell you, I've heard some things that are happening in some places make my hair curl, what I've got left. And they are saying things, doing things. May I say to you, I don't think you could do them unless your conscience has been seared 
with a hot iron. You've got away from the Word of God. You see, you have a tender conscience in the church. Oh, today, the church needs to recognize how important it is in the plan and purpose of God, and it should not stoop to a low level. Now, this has been going on a long time. Even in Christ's day, there were folk that had gone off into cults and isms from Judaism. For instance, forbidding to marry, verse 3 now, and commanding to abstain from foods which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving by them who believe and know the truth. And these are dot faddists, and they make certain rules and regulations that are not in the Word of God, forbidding to marry. Now, in Christ's day, down by the Dead Sea, there were a group of Essenes, as they were called, and it was among them that the scrolls, the Isaiah scrolls, and they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls, have been found. They were down there, and even in Christ's day. And when Christianity came along, they hooked on to it, you see, forbidding to marry, and they had that, commanding to abstain from foods. And today, there are those that go off on that as if food would commend you to God. Now, it is true if you eat the wrong kind of food that you get a tummy ache, but that hasn't anything to do with your spiritual life, my friend. It may affect it, but it has nothing to do with it. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, the word of God does not condemn it. It commends it. And if you can return thanks for food, then may I say that sanctifies it for your body because the Word of God has already said. Now, there's certain things I can't be thankful for. Down in San Antonio, Texas, I'm told there's a place that cans rattlesnake meat, and that's a delicacy, so I'm told. Now, if you would invite me to dinner and tell me you had rattlesnake meat for dinner and ask me to return thanks... I don't think I would. I'd say, I'm sorry. I can't be thankful for this, my brother. If it can be received with thanksgiving, why, you just go ahead, friends, eat it. Just whatever you can eat, you eat it. It's perfectly all right. Now, this is a very wonderful passage of Scripture, you see, because this is the very thing that a man of God today, a servant of God, is going to avoid. These are the things he's to avoid. And he says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these, thou shalt be a good minister, Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine under which thou hast attained. And so I conclude with that. I have attempted to do what this passage says. I have attempted to put you brethren and some of you sisters in remembrance of these things. And I do that because I want to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And I want to teach the Word of God that's going to nourish you and build you up in the faith and establish you that you can stand not only in this world, but stand before Him someday. We'll break off our study right there today. May God richly bless you, my beloved. One of the reasons Dr. McGee's clear and simple teaching of God's Word nourishes, builds up, and establishes us in our faith is because he teaches doctrine, which is a big word for the basic things that we believe. We can see from our study in 1 Timothy that teaching doctrine helps us to protect ourselves against error. Simply put, if we know the truth, it's easier to spot the lies. If you'd like to share these messages with a family member or friend, download through the Bible's app or visit ttb.org where you can listen online. Or if you'd like to gift them with a copy of our Bible Bus flash drive that's got all of Dr. McGee's five-year messages, more than 100 of his digital booklets, and his notes and outlines for every book that we study, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. It's a great tool. It's packed full of trustworthy teaching. Again, the number 1-800-65-BIBLE or check it out in our online store at ttb.org. And of course, you can always write to us at Box 7100. 
Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. What's so important about the church? That's the truth that we'll discover on our next trip on the Bible bus. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll see you then. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.